prolific author with 13 books and a 14th on the way. She's been writing for publications since she was a teenager. She also sports over 900 po podcasts under her beacon belt, where she highlights vitality, spirituality, and compassion. Her Main Street Vegan Academy trains vegan coaches, educators, and entrepreneurs. Watch for her newest endeavor, a, theme, a feature film called Miss Liberty, about a cow who escapes from a slaughterhouse. So in this presentation, Ahimsa Ayurveda, the extra oomph in your vibrant lifestyle, she'll share how health, self-care, and compassion can come together to offer the opportunity to feel spectacular. <coughs> Best of all, she exemplifies all she teaches. Please welcome Victoria Moran. Aww, thank you so much. Oops. Thank you. And this is the powerhouse who is, I know many people are behind this conference, but this woman is just a miracle worker. So thank you so much for this amazing day and for everything that you do. Now I'm going to need a little clicker, little thing to move the screens forward. Let's see. Here, this looks like it. Let's see if it works. Aha! You see? <laughs> when you live right. And, and we were told that it's hard from the back to see the bottom of the screen, so if you want to see everything, feel free to move up because it's nice and friendly up here. So, why Ayurveda? Number one, I'm so happy that you all came because a lot of people find Ayurveda a very new word and it's foreign and they don't know how to pronounce it. So I know I talked to someone earlier who is familiar with Ayurveda. So who's familiar? Who has some background in Ayurveda? Okay, okay, great. And who, who is just brave and came? <laughs> Okay, cool. All right. Well, this is very elementary, so those of you who are experts probably already know a lot. I'll tell you a little bit about how I got involved in Ayurveda. I've been involved in yoga for almost ever. I was 17, and it really was not very well known at all. We're talking in the 1960s. And so everybody said yoga might be a fermented milk product from Russia, but whatever it is, it just it's foreign, it's probably dangerous, stay away, which of course made me want to find out all about it. So there were three books at that time in the Kansas City, Missouri Public Library, and they all said, if you want to be serious about yoga, you have to be vegetarian. So I kind of started on this path that way, but I did not hear about Ayurveda, even though it's yoga's sister science. And what I came to know was that when India was colonized by Britain, they knew enough as longtime colonizers to let people keep their religions and their philosophies. So the yoga and all that was going strong. But they shut down Ayurveda and wanted to bring in Western medicine. So Ayurveda didn't start becoming known in the West until the 1990s, and it is gaining more popularity all the time. And the reason that I love to speak about Ayurveda in a plant-based conference context is because we often hear people say, oh yeah, I used to eat like that, but, and then they'll say these vague things. So you ever heard anybody say, I used to be whole food plant-based, but then I developed heart disease, super high cholesterol, type two diabetes. It doesn't happen. They say, I used to do that, and well, I just didn't feel right. Or my stomach just didn't feel very good. Or I felt tired. Now, oftentimes, that's kind of, if you read between the lines, a little cover for something social, like I got a new boyfriend and he's keto. But sometimes <laughs> it's also that maybe if they had just customized it a little bit, and instead of taking it to a hook, line, and sinker, as my mother used to say, they would make it a little more personal. It might work better. And Ayurveda is all about 
personalizing our health care and our self care so that it works specifically for who we are. So we're going to start out today with some general great Ayurvedic information for just being healthier and happier. And then we're going to zero in on the Ayurvedic body type, the doshas, so that you can learn a little bit more about yourself and how to take care of yourself specifically. So I do want to talk about this product. Look how saturated it looks. <laughs> this is ghee. This is clarified butter. It's very big in Indian culture, and it's very popular in, in both Indian cuisine and in Ayurveda, both medicinally and in a culinary sense. Now, obviously, as an ethical vegan, I'm not having ghee as butter. That is taken from a cow, and it should have been milk for a baby cow, in my opinion. So I don't use ghee, and I wouldn't use it anyway because it's a highly saturated fat, and we know that the reasons that long before anybody ever heard of whole food plant-based, when vegans were just pure vegetarians, we still did really well in terms of heart disease because we weren't taking in saturated fat, which is found almost entirely in animal products, and in tropical oils. And nowadays, for some reason, people have gotten this thing that coconut oil is some kind of health food. That is just so backwards, it's highly saturated, and so is palm oil, which is not only saturated, but is tearing up rainforests and causing all kinds of difficulties for the people in those areas, and also uh, taking the orangutan's environment, so we don't wanna be having that either. But animal products, and dairy products in particular, are the primary source of saturated fat in the American diet, so ghee would be a problem. Now, I have a 12-step background, and we say in 12 steps, take what you like and leave the rest. So I take so much great stuff from Ayurveda, and I leave the ghee. It's allowed. Now, the good people at Nutiva, which is a nice company that makes all kinds of plant-based products, was getting the idea. A lot of people are into Ayurveda these days. So maybe if we made vegan ghee, we could sell it. So they do, and it exists. It's made from coconut oil and some spices. So I wouldn't use it, but if you want to, there you go. So I want to start out by talking about Ayurveda that doesn't have so much to do with food, but that has to do with how we live in harmony with nature. So the very term Ayurveda means it's Ayur, science or knowledge of Veda, life. So in Understanding life, we have to understand that in physical incarnation, we're part of nature. And the more we can be in harmony with nature, the better off we'll be. So the day has its cycles. And sometimes you get a sense, you almost know without even looking at a clock, kind of what's going on with the day. Like right now, it just feels like afternoon. Just the way the sun is coming into the windows, you can tell what time of day we're in. And the more we can accommodate these cycles, the better off we'll be in terms of our health. So in Ayurveda, the day begins the night before. So it's really important what you're eating or not eating, what you're thinking, what you're exposed to before it's time to go to bed. So you want to have your dinner, or I call it supper, because in Ayurveda we have the big meal in the middle of the day and a lighter meal in the evening. And you want to finish that ideally three hours before bed. So if you could eat at 6 or 6.30 and have it all done by 7 and then go to bed by 10, that's perfect. If you can't do that, at least two hours. You don't want to go to bed digesting food. You want it to all be digested so at nighttime you're assimilating, you're detoxifying. You want to go to bed between 9 and 10 and you don't want to have electronics right before then. So if you're going to go to bed at 10 o'clock, just kind of shut the electronics off by 9. And that's absolutely terrifying for a lot of people because we're just so tied to these things, particularly the phone. I mean, did you ever think you would ever have something in your pocket that was everything, that was all the libraries of the world? that was photographs and movies and entertainment and maps. It's really something, but it's also something to sometimes set aside. 
and let go of, particularly before bed. And, and TV counts too, because we don't want that blue light coming into our eyes when we're going to be winding down for sleep, because that blue light inhibits the production of melatonin. And you get a little bit older, and you're not making as much melatonin as you used to anyway, so you don't want any more competition for this lovely hormone that is going to help you sleep. Then you want your room to be dark and quiet, and if you want to put a little lavender oil on your pillow, that is extra credit. We also talked in the earlier class that if you do have trouble falling asleep at night, an Ayurvedic suggestion is to massage your feet with warm sesame oil. So we're talking plain old sesame oil, not the cured kind for, for flavored and cooking. Just plain old sesame oil. So how do you heat it? You can either get one of those little tea light burners where you put a candle in and you put the oil in the top, or you can just take the oil and put it in a little plastic container and stick that in a mug of hot water. Just warm it up. So this is warm, not hot. You don't want to burn yourself hot. Oil can be really hot. But with this warm sesame oil, massage it into your feet. And you can also massage your hands. You can rub a little into your temples. And then put some nice loose socks on and go to bed. And it seems silly. It seems like, why would that help? I can't tell you why. I can just tell you that it does. So give it a try and see if it works for you. So as you get up in the morning, the reason to get up around 6 o'clock, 6.30 is OK, but do not loll a bed because these cycles of nature are designed to help you get up when it's time to get up, fall asleep when it's time to go to sleep. So when you stay up really late at night, and we hear people all the time, they'll say, oh, I got second wind. No, you didn't get second wind. It was just that nature went into more of a wake-up cycle, and now you're going to be up for another three hours, whether you want it to be or not. The same thing happens in the morning. Oh, I'm really tired. I'm just going to hit the snooze. You hit snooze enough, you're going to be groggy till 11 o'clock. So if you can train yourself, even in increments of 15 minutes, to get to bed a little bit earlier and get up a little bit earlier, it's going to make such a difference in your life. So there are lots of things that Ayurveda suggests that we might do in the morning. And you don't have to do all of them, or you don't have to do everything every day. But I'm going to talk about some of the basics. So the first is splash, scrape, and swish. <laughs> so splash is just get up and go in the bathroom and splash your face, ideally with cool water. This wakes you up. If you tend to have a little puffiness around your eyes, it brings that down. And it's just a woohoo, good morning, here we are. And scrape is to scrape your tongue. And that sounds so rough, scrape. But it's really to just clean your tongue with a little tongue scraper that you can get at good drug stores these days or Indian markets or, or health food stores. And it's just a little bit of motion five or six times over the tongue. Because what happens at night, this is the time when the body detoxifies. And you wake up in the morning and you might not have your best breath. And you might also notice a little bit of coating on the tongue. And you really get this if you've ever fasted. Has anybody fasted? I mean, you your tongue is like it's wearing argyle socks because you're detoxing so much. But every morning, you just want to scrape that coating off before you drink anything or before you kiss anybody. And this removes ama, which is the uh, Sanskrit word for metabolic debris that builds up over time. And then there's swish. And that is short for oil pulling. Has anybody done oil pulling? OK. So oil pulling is something that you might do in lieu of mouthwash, but it does so much more than mouthwash. Because in Ayurveda, we're told that the properties of oil draw things out. So what we want to do is swish in the mouth. You're not going to swallow it. Oil, sesame oil, Ayurveda just likes for everything. And since you're already having it to rub on your feet at night, just use this for your oil swishing as well. But after you scrape your tongue, you just swish it around in your mouth, sort of like mouthwash. But here's the deal. You do it for longer. You do it for about five minutes. 
So you can multitask a little bit. You can be swishing and you know, letting the dog out or putting the dishes away or starting coffee, whatever it is, and then spit that out, not into the sink because it could over time clog things up, but into a trash can or into the toilet, and then swish with water. And you have, according to Ayurveda, not only helped to cleanse and reduce the bacterial load in your mouth, which we know is really important because that can lead to heart disease and, and other things, but you're also helping to detox in a systemic way. There is a book you can read, The Miracle of Oil Pulling, or you can just try it and see what you think. I would not be without it. You, you do these things and some of them are like, well, that was fine, but now it's gonna fall away. For me, the oil pulling is one that I do every day without fail. And then you can brush your teeth either right after that or after breakfast. You had a question? Tablespoon or how much? Just whatever it takes to fill your mouth, you know, kind of like what you do with mouthwash. So you brush your teeth either after this or after breakfast. I wait till after breakfast. But Ayurveda says that also very close to first thing in the morning, you want to hydrate because we dehydrate overnight. I mean, we're in bed eight or nine hours and probably not drinking any water. And so when we wake up, our tissues, every cell is really going to need some hydration. So you want to drink a lot of water at this time. I drink about 16 ounces. And you can put lemon in that, or you can have some sliced ginger. It can be room temperature or warm or hot. Ayurveda doesn't like cold beverages because they douse the digestive fire. And also, anything that gets the body a little bit off. Now the body is 98.6, so when you're having an ice drink, that's going to lower the body temperature and the body's going to have to work to bring it back up. So a warm room temperature or hot water. And this is the only time in the day when Ayurveda suggests drinking a large quantity of water. Otherwise, the recommendation is for sipping warm water throughout the day. And then do some kind of morning exercise. So going outside and walking in the sunlight, even if it's just to walk your dog, is a wonderful thing. It's suggested in Ayurveda, but also in Western medicine, because this is how we're going to get our sleep cycles straightened out. When you get that early morning sunlight into your pineal gland, then that's going to help regulate the melatonin production. So when you go to bed at quarter to 10 or whatever it is the next night, you're going to be able to fall asleep better. And over time, this is going to build up and really make a difference for you. But also some early morning yoga. And I'm not talking about a big old hour and a half yoga class, but five to 10 minutes of just stretching so that you really feel that everything is working right. You know, something happens as time passes. The time comes in every life when you get out of bed one morning and it's like, wait a minute, these are aches and pains. They weren't supposed to come for another 15 years yet. Well, there they are. So the reason for that is we tend to sleep tense. So what do most people do with their evenings? They watch the news. And then because maybe everybody's been working all day, husband and wife haven't had time to talk about the finances, the health of the relative, whatever it is, so we've got all this negative stuff, and then we go to bed, and we're tense, and we're tight, and we sleep like this, and we wake up, and we wonder why we have aches and pains. We're lucky to get up. So you want to stretch that stuff out in the early morning, and you also want to do it at night. Like if you're watching TV, whatever, just there's no law against pulling out your yoga mat and doing some stretches during law and order. It is allowed. And when you go to bed loose, you wake up loose. And this is so important because as you look at older people, and I think in many cases it seems to be worse for men because maybe women are cooler with doing flexibility stuff. You know, men want to do strength and they want to do endurance. And so they just flexibility, oh, that's no big deal. But then what happens for so many older people, particularly men, I think, is they just get this kind of stiffness. It's almost like Frankenstein. And you just want to put your hands on your shoulders and say, 
it's okay. You can relax. But if you start doing this little bit of stretching, nighttime, morning, that will never happen. Frankenstein can stay on the screen and is not going to invade your body. So Abhyanga, which is warm oil massage, even if you are an oil-free person in your diet, Ayurveda loves oil on the outside. In fact, the word in Sanskrit for oil, sneha, is also the word that means love. <laughs> so there's a lot to that. So every now and then, and depending on who you are and your body type and what you're dealing with, you might do it more or less often. We want to do this morning warm oil massage. So why would we want to do that? Well, because when you massage around your joints, they just seem to soak that up and love it. And any kind of like creaky, cracky, arthritic kind of thing over time is going to be a lot happier getting that sort of lubrication. There's also something kind of magical about Abhyanga, this warm sesame oil massage in the morning. I feel like I'm in your way of the screen. And that is that it kind of warms you all day. If it's cold season and you're going to go outside and be cold, it's like that little bitty layer of oil left on your skin is sort of like another layer of clothing. And you can go out and not feel so cold, especially if you're someone who is prone to feeling cold, whether it's winter or whether you're in a hotel <laughs> with air conditioning. So you warm up the sesame oil, just like I said to do um, for uh, massaging your feet. But you start at the top of your head with the flat of your hands. You use long strokes around your long bones, round circles around the joints. And then you want to focus on your head and your feet. Now, obviously, if you're not going to wash your hair that day, you know, don't do your head. Uh, but spend a lot of time, and by a lot of time, I mean a minute, um, on your feet. Because there are those reflexology points there. In Ayurveda, we call them marma points. And you really want to get in there. Now, a little caveat, your feet are going to be oily. So um, you want to put on some slippers or just be really careful when you get in the shower. So let it soak in. Ideally, if you've got 20 minutes, you can let that oil soak in and then wipe off your feet really well and get in the shower. So what I like to do is I do the Abhyanga, I do the little bit of yoga, do the Abhyanga, and then I do my 20 minute meditation and let that oil sink in. And by then, I hardly even need to wipe off my feet because I'm dry and so it all soaks in but definitely get rid of some of the slipperiness on your feet before you take your shower, and then you are ready for breakfast and your wonderful day. So, breakfast, yes? I'm stuck on there. Okay, where do you buy the sesame oil? Oh, okay. And you're supposed to put that also in the mouth, even though that you'd be putting on your body? Yes, the same, same oil, very simple. No, it's regular sesame oil. And people who cook with oil could cook with it, but there's a special kind of sesame oil that's been like curated or smoked or something. And people use that a lot in Indian cooking, kind of with not too much of it. So a lot of people think it's that. You just want plain, ordinary, old sesame oil. So I get mine from a place called Banyan Botanicals. They're online. Uh, and I think they also sell through Amazon. I don't work for them. I don't get a cut or anything. But they have very good products. And it's, it's fun to go to their website. I'll mention it again later because they have a, a little quiz you might want to take. So breakfast in Ayurveda is... I have one more. Because those of us, I know you're not friends here, cloudy a lot. Yeah. And you're going to be bad weather. Do you believe in life boxes? Do I believe in what? Oh, yeah, yeah. The light boxes are great. In the dead of winter, you might want to go outside in the sun and use a light box for 15 minutes. Yeah, it, it's great. So uh, we're having breakfast now. So in Ayurveda, your digestive fire is ready for food three times a day. So you want to give it something. Now, for some people, breakfast is like, bring it on. You know, we really like a nice breakfast. And other people are like, ugh. Not, not really. 
And so they just want something light. Stewed apples are a perfect light Ayurvedic breakfast for somebody like that. So you just cook the apples on the stove, you put in some cinnamon and some clove, and if that's all you need, that and a little ginger tea, that's fine. But if you want a more substantial breakfast, any kind of good plant-based breakfast, like oatmeal with all the stuff we put on top of oatmeal. I mean, I never just have oatmeal. I have an oatmeal parfait. So it's going to have the berries and some chopped walnuts and flax and chia and a little maybe chopped dates and then, of course, lots of spices. So whatever it is for you that works for breakfast, just be sure to have something. So as we move into the day, midday is when this digestive fire is hottest. Agni means fire, digestive fire. And so we're going to have a really nice meal. And this picture, I mean, it's typical whole food plant-based way to eat. So there's a grain there that happens to be quinoa. There's some um, tempeh for the legume thing, got sweet potato, we've got mixed greens and some nice little sauces there on the side. So a really substantial meal. Now I understand if you work outside the home and you've got 30 minutes for lunch, it's not going to be perfect every day. But maybe a little bit heavier lunch, a little bit lighter dinner, and on the weekends or whenever your time is your own, try to flip it around and have dinner in the middle of the day and supper at night, like maybe your grandparents, if they were on a farm, did this sort of thing, you know, the big meal in the middle of the day and not so much in the evening. Now, fresh ginger, wonderful for digestion, powdered ginger is as well. And something you can do that's really fun and really tasty is to make ginger pickles. Has anybody done ginger pickles? It's so easy. You tell somebody you're making pickles, they think you're canning or something. But all you have to do for ginger pickles is scrub the ginger root and slice it fairly thin, but so that it won't flop over when you pick it up. So it's kind of like a, a coin. And then you soak that in lemon juice, and if you use a little bit of salt, a little, little tiny bit of salt, you could put a little bit of turmeric in there as well and a little black pepper. And just let it marinate for a few hours. And these ginger pickles will keep in the fridge for about five days. And before lunch, either right before, ideally they tell you 30 minutes before, but I'm not thinking about lunch 30 minutes before. I'm thinking about whatever I'm doing. And then I think about lunch when I get hungry. So anyway, before lunch, before dinner, have a couple of ginger pickles, it will help with the digestion. And also after meals, it is suggested that we take a little walk. And this is not a power walk, this is a stroll. This is about digestion. And if it's raining out, if you don't wanna go outside, then maybe you could, I don't know, if you have a treadmill, you could walk on that kind of slow speed, or you could also do what's called LSD. Not that kind. It's left side down because it helps the digestion proceed if you lie on your left side. The little walk is preferable, but the left side down works too. We talked about sipping the water or herbal tea through the day and not getting into a lot of um, iced beverages. And here's a list of some of Ayurveda's favorite herbal teas, ginger, licorice, fenugreek, Tulsi, which is also called holy basil, turmeric, and mint. Now, licorice, uh, avoid if you have high blood pressure. Otherwise, it's wonderful. It's naturally sweet. Years ago, it got a Diet Coke monkey the size of Texas off my back <laughs> because it just had that lovely sweetness and helped me get over soda. So Ayurveda suggests that we have all six tastes in, in our midday meal and our evening meal. You don't have to be that fancy at breakfast time. So most of the six tastes we've heard of, in our culture, we tend to live almost entirely on the first two, the sweet and the sour, and we let go of the others. And if you've ever been somebody who's kind of opened the refrigerator door looking for the meaning of life, it's like <laughs> there's something missing. I just ate. But there's something missing. And Ayurveda would say it's probably one of these tastes. So sweet is not just sugar, which of course is not recommended, but 
fruits, grains, bread. In Ayurveda, they would say milk, meaning dairy. I count our um, non-dairy milks, even the unsweetened ones in this category. Sour, citrus, fermented foods, salty, salt obviously. Most of us are cutting out salt or cutting it way down, but seaweed, miso, celery has that savory taste as well. Bitter, greens like chicory, endive, kale, the spice turmeric, again, which we know is a fabulous antioxidant all-star, and coffee, which is so funny because most people get the bitter taste almost entirely from coffee, might be one reason it's so popular. Pungent, those are the spices we think of as spicy, like the radishes and onion and that sort of thing. And the astringent taste is one that we're not so used to. And it's almost like a taste that was on its way to sour, but it didn't get very far. It just gets to be a little bit dry, a little bit puckery. If you think about beans, tofu, white potatoes, apple, especially green apples, and pomegranate, can you kind of sense what they all have in common? It's kind of clean and kind of dry. That's the astringent taste. Now, if it feels complicated to get all of those in your two main meals, there is a lovely cheat, and that is chutney. So chutney is a wonderful Indian condiment used sort of the way we use cranberry sauce at Thanksgiving. And you can buy it. A lot of them have a lot of sugar, so you do want to check your label and, and sugar content if you're buying chutney. But they can be based on mango or apple or raisins, all kinds of fruits. So you can make your own chutney. And they have spices in them, so they're designed to have all of the tastes, and that's a way to help out. So Ayurveda says when diet is wrong, medicine is of no use. Um, and when diet is correct, medicine is of no need. And I think we would agree with that probably in this room. So the gunas are a concept that comes from yoga, and they're in Ayurveda as well, that everything on earth is one of these three energies. So when we think about inertia and decay, these are the kinds of foods that are old and they're stale and they've been processed and they've been sitting around and they're full of chemicals that were never food to begin with. They just kind of make you feel tired. And when you eat too much of this kind of food, you're just not interested in like philanthropy or, you know, <laughs> you know, getting out there and making the world better or seeking the meaning of life. It's just kind of like, you know, just go away. I'm done with this. But then, on the other side, we've got these foods that are called rajasic, and they are going to pump you up and pep you up. And what is our favorite rajasic food of all time? It is coffee. And you can go to Starbucks, and they don't have it on the menu. Then you think the biggest you can get is a venti, but they even have one that's bigger, bigger, bigger than that. And then you can add a couple of extra shots of espresso, and you are going, 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 going. And if you go to a part of the world where they don't even drink coffee, they make the tea so black and so thick and so strong that you get the same kind of power that you would get from the coffee. And if that is not enough, then you should eat some eggs. You should eat some fried eggs and really get yourself going. And then you should have some hot, hot spices, and out you go. Okay. Think about spiritual growth, which was where all this started in ancient India. So if you're over here on the tamasic side, you're going to fall asleep if you try to meditate. And over here on the rajasic side, you can't sit. So the ancient yogis looked at food and said, what's in the middle? What can we eat that will balance people out so that they can sit for meditation, live long, live well, live healthfully? Well, what they came up with was the same kind of food that our lifestyle medicine doctors are talking about today. Fruits, vegetables, whole grains, legumes, nuts and seeds. Now, they also included milk from healthy cows. And probably 4,000 years ago in India, 
where there weren't a lot of people and everybody had a cow and the cow was respected, it might have worked. Those cows may well have been healthy and the milk may have been karma free. We have not lived in a world like that in centuries. So let's just keep it vegan with all due respect. Now these sattvic foods, these ones in the middle, are best freshly prepared. And in the real world, that's rough. When you're working and you've got a million things going on, it may make a lot of sense to make your rice and your soups and a couple of entrees and maybe a nice um, apple crisp or something on the weekend to have for the week ahead. But generally speaking, when you can eat food freshly prepared, it's got the most life force energy to it. So treat yourself when you can. Now we're going to move into that portion of Ayurveda that talks about the body types, about specializing all of this information precisely for you. So the body types, Vata, Pitta, and Kapha, all come from the energies, the elements of the earth. And they govern not only the bodies, but also the earth itself and life. Now I talked about the gunas, that's a different concept. We're gonna move on, this is, this is something different. So package that over in one category. And now we're moving to doshas. So your own particular dosha type was established at the moment of conception. And it's gonna be some combination of these energies of vata, pitta, and kapha. Now, whatever your type is, is absolutely perfect. And I love that because we have come through many, many decades of people, women in particular, being told, whatever you are is wrong. You know, back in the, like prior to World War I, women were supposed to be really voluptuous and women who were thin wouldn't even go to the beach because they were too skinny. And then in comes skinny time and you're supposed to look like Twiggy. It's just been really overbearing. But Ayurveda says your energies, your body type, your combination is perfect. Your job throughout your life is to keep yourself in the same kind of balance that you were born with. So Vata is considered slender, Pitta is considered muscular, Kapha is considered a little bit rounder, and they are all absolutely perfect. So Vata, we've got Fred and Audrey, and they're like the ultimate Vata. So it's the dancer body, it's the long neck and the long fingers. Vata people are often very mobile and they are curious and they light up a room. They're absolutely delightful, charming, but out of balance, anxious, cold, joints ache, a little bit of arthritis setting in earlier than it ought to, and I'm just so scared. So you want that to balance out. You'll still be Vata, but you will be balanced Vata, charming and delightful by staying warm, hydrated, predictable schedule, not being too upset by things. And in terms of food, a vata is going to love the hot cereals, the soups, the stews, what we think of as kind of winter uh, food, and things that are a little bit soupier and a little bit um, more moist. Then pitta, we have here Venus and Serena, and it's lovely to see that I am thinking that Serena is pure pitta, really muscle, muscle, muscle. And Venus, I would say, is a pitta vata. She's got the muscle, but she's also got a little bit more of, of the slenderness that typifies uh, vata. So pitta is hot. It means that which cooks. And so a pitta person needs to be brought down because what happens to them when they're out of balance is inflammation a lot of um, heartburn, um, skin breaks at breakouts, rage emotionally. So while a vata is going to get scared, a pitta is probably going to get mad at <laughs> the very same provocation. So um, you want to have food that is cooling, 
cucumbers and and cold soups and all that lovely kind of food. And even though Ayurveda doesn't like frosty stuff for anybody, it's a pitta who can have some vegan ice cream, who can have the really icy smoothie and, and feel more balanced from that. So every time of life has a dosha as well. So whatever your own makeup is always gonna be that. But in childhood, we're all more kapha, which we're coming to in a minute, and from like 16 to 55 approximately, we're all more pitta. And it makes sense because pitta is good with executive functioning. It's strong, it's energetic. It's gonna go out there and do the things that we have to do between 16 and 55, like getting educated and finding a career and a mate and a home and a family and taking care of the aging parents and all that. And then vata comes in in the later part of life. So it works out. So to pacify pitta, we want cool rooms and cool foods, drying and astringent foods. Pitta gets really hungry. I always think of those 1960s kind of sitcoms, honey, I'm home, where's dinner? Why isn't dinner on the table? Well, whether that's a male or a female, that's very pitta. Pitta can actually get angry when hungry or you know, they're at a restaurant and it's taking too long, where other people might get kind of like, I don't know what's going on, I'm bored. The pitta is gonna be upset about it. Now, kapha is, is a beautiful dosha, and a lot of people say, oh, I don't wanna be kapha because you know they have a little bit more body flesh because we've been through all these decades of, of feeling like everybody's supposed to be skinny. But kapha is the healthiest of the doshas because it's slow moving. And that means it's not going to become unbalanced. So vata gets out of balance the most and kapha the least. So we look at these lovely kapha people and they do tend to be full bodied and they tend to not like to exercise very much. So they do need to move and they need a little stimulation. So while vata needs the stimulants to really calm down, like let's kind of keep everything on a schedule with kapha, they need a little bit of, of push. So even though Ayurveda generally is not a fan of caffeine, they'll say, yeah, give kapha some coffee in the morning, get him going. Really um, uh, active kind of, of exercise, travel, and new stimulation. That's all great for kapha. And um, you want to find out the kinds of, of diet that keeps you from getting mucousy because that is the one thing that really healthy kapha is prone to. And if you think about it, I said kapha is dominant for everybody in childhood, and that's when we get the mucousy conditions, ear infections, and that kind of thing. So you want the stimulating exercise, some stimulating food, change of scenery, and these beautiful, simple kinds of foods, like the cherries and the berries, black beans, chickpeas, tempeh, rice, quinoa, and snacking is discouraged. Actually, it's discouraged in Ayurveda for everybody, except sometimes vata can get so droopy right about this time of day, three o'clock slump, that an Ayurvedic doctor once said to me, because I'm predominantly vata, he said, in the afternoon, have some herbal tea and a little apple pie. And I thought, <laughs> I love this doctor. <laughs> that is a prescription I can take. So just to help you understand the doshas a little bit better, see this letter from the IRS? It shows up on a Friday, and you pick it up after work. And there's nothing you can do about it until Monday. So if you are a vata and you're in balance, you'll still be a little bit nervous, because that's what vata does. but you'll deal with it. If you're out of balance, if you're a vata who's been eating a lot of cold food, if you've been traveling and changing time zones, if you've been having anxiety about other things in your life, that's gonna be lost weekend. You're gonna just be scared to death until you can get to this thing. Now, pitta in balance is gonna be a bit perturbed. What do they want with me? Because I never do anything wrong. But out of balance, they're just gonna be mad. It's like, who am I gonna be mad at? Am I gonna pick on the IRS? Am I gonna pick on H&R Block? It's somebody's fault. Kapha in balance, eh, no big deal. Take care of it Monday. 
Kafa out of balance, we'll throw it on the huge pile of other papers that they have on their desk, maybe lose it, and it could lead to real trouble later. So whatever your doshic proclivity, you want to keep yourself in balance by some of these lovely things that we talked about earlier, like living in balance with nature's timing. The seasons, uh, vata season, late fall to early winter, Kapha season, coldest, darkest part of winter into spring, Pitta season, summer. And all this means is that we just follow our instincts during the seasons. So when it starts to be spring like it is now, we're looking around for the fresh greens. We're looking for the first strawberries because that's what the body needs. Now spices, amazing. I love this picture. I love the jars. Otherwise, I wouldn't have the salt right out there in front because we're not doing much salt with the whole food plant-based. But all of these other spices are so great. And I've listed here the specific ones for the specific doshas. Now, how do you find out what your dosha is? Well, you probably already have an idea, but to get an absolute picture of the balance, that store that I told you about, the online store, and again, I'm not an affiliate. I don't get anything by telling you this, but I really like their dosha quiz. BanyanBotanicals.com slash quiz or slash dosha quiz. It might be dosha quiz, but anyway, you'll find it if you go to the website and you just answer the questions and just don't overthink it. Just whatever comes to mind is probably going to be the answer. Here's a couple of books to start with. The Ayurvedic Self-Care Handbook is absolutely lovely. It even comes with a little ribbon to keep your place. Um, lovely um, doctor of chiropractic and Ayurvedic practitioner in Kansas City, Dr. Kuchera. And Deepak Chopra's very first book, Perfect Health. It's not vegetarian, but you know, we take what we like, we leave the rest, we read between the lines. Dr. Chopra himself is vegetarian, and I'm hearing that at this point he is vegan. That's good news. And here are a couple of vegan Ayurvedic cookbooks, Eat, Feel, Fresh, and The Ayurvedic Vegan Kitchen. And my next book, Age Like a Yogi, is about yoga philosophy and Ayurveda for living well and moving on into the next phase with health and vitality and joy and wonder. It is available for pre-order. And if you pre-order and then you um, send your receipt to my assistant, assist at victoriamoran.com, and that's on the website too if you forget that, um, you are invited to an exclusive day-long retreat happening just before the publication date for this book in January. And you will also, much sooner than January, receive the Age Like a Yogi Recipes ebook. And thank you so much for considering this because it could help me get on the New York Times bestseller list, which after 13 previous books I've always wanted and never had it happen. And I guess that's it. So. You're going to have a fabulous presentation coming up. I'm so excited about hearing about how the big guys have conspired to make us not as healthy as we need to be. So, um, you know, you might want to just get up and stretch and sit right back down for the next presentation. Thank you all so much.